Good day and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, delegates and representatives to uh, our virtual side event of the 30th Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice uh, with the topic New Village Development, Countering Migration, uh, Involuntary Migration and the Smuggling of Migrants. So as a grassroots NGO, the Women's Federation for World Peace International is very excited uh, and passionate about prevention and uh, creating a sustainable and enriching living environments for all. So I was, I was gone, but back again, my apologies. So um, therefore we're very uh, grateful and excited that you all chose to be part of this meeting and uh, could uh, make time in your busy schedules and special appreciation to the embassies of Kenya and the Philippines for being part of this and supporting us. Thank you very much. So before we um, continue with the opening remarks, we would like, I would like to make a practical point. Um, we, if you have any questions for the speakers of today, please uh, write them in the chat box. So in the chat, not in the Q&A, but the chat box. Uh, we will be sure that we'll answer your questions. As time is little within the event, uh, we will have a short Q&A session after the event, after the official closing of the event. And also we want to make sure to forward your questions to the speakers. So if you have uh, registered without email, please be sure to note your contact information as well, so we can make that possible for you. And last but not least, we, are also, we also want to alert that we are also live streaming on Facebook uh, on our Women's Federation for World Peace uh, Europe Facebook page. So having said that, welcome again. And it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Maria Ariel, the director of the Women's Federation for World Peace UN, UN office in Vienna. Dr. Ariel, the floor is yours with the opening remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, Kyongin. <clears throat> dear Excellencies, dear friends from far and from the neighborhood, thank you for joining us today on May 17th to our side event during the 30th Conference on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. Women's Federation for World Peace International together with Earth Foundation and representative of governments from Kenya and Philippines are inspired by outcome of Kyoto Conference to support and strengthen the cooperation between civil society representing by NGOs and governments to achieve SDG until 2030 and lay good foundation for healthy families and for protection of, of peace and prosperity on our planet. Migration and all kinds of criminal outcome because of poverty, less education and unemployment, especially for women and young people, should be considered as not necessary in the future. Through technological achievements and cooperation in communities, new possibilities are open for us to work together for well-being in every corner of our planet. We will introduce today three excellent practical examples to your attention. All three reports are about cooperation between academic research at the universities and school of vocational training in rural areas where young people and even three or four generations can work together for a better future for all of us and to leave no one behind. Thank you for, for coming to us and now I like to invite Mrs. Stella Mokaya Orina, Deputy Representative, to Mr. Robinson Nieru Kite Gitae, the Ambassador of Republic of Kenya. Please, the floor is yours, 
please share your words and your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you and all the participants from wherever you are joining us. Um, I wish to welcome you all to this side event organized by the Women's Federation for World Peace International, pulling together discussions on the topic of today, new village development to counter involuntary migration and the smuggling of migrants. Uh, I also wish to recognize the presence of the distinguished Chargeur d'Affaires of the Embassy of Philippines here in Vienna. And uh, I also recognize um, uh, Madame Renet, president of the Women's Federation for World Peace International, who has just spoken. I recognize the speakers for today's event and uh, look forward to listening to their presentations. Uh, His Excellency Ambassador Robinson Jerugidai had confirmed attendance of this meeting but is unable to join today due to last minute unforeseen circumstances. I convey his apologies and on his behalf, I wish to commend you for the efforts that you're making to empower citizens in different parts of the globe. It is true that uh, people like to settle around areas that have electricity. This means that electricity influences migration as people would prefer to settle where they have access to electricity because electricity is essential for everything. It is essential for reading. It is essential for lighting. People want to charge their phones. They want to use electricity for cooking. It is important for businesses and the list goes on. The government of Kenya recognizes the importance of electricity and has put uh, in place various projects and programs to generate a green energy for its population. We have the Kenya Energy Policy of 2018, the Kenya Energy Act of 2019. Both the policy and the act contain provisions on renewable energy where solar energy is included. Kenya lies across the equator and uh, because of this strategic location, we have enough sunshine for investment in solar energy. So the government is keen to supply solar energy to homes, to institutions, to businesses, and even for use in irrigation. There are 12 counties um, that uh, the government is planning to power through the Kenya Off-Grid Solar Access in acronym COSA, and it's being implemented in collaboration with the World Bank. These 12 counties are majorly in the rural areas of Northern Kenya and some of them are in the coastal region. Opportunities also exist in manufacture of associated components and accessories such as chargers, inverters and batteries. The government has provided solar lamps and chargers in some areas, particularly yeah, the county governments have done well in this, and uh, we have uh, counties such as Migori where this is happening. In one of our counties in eastern Machakos County, we have an entire street that is solar lit. So that is also very innovative. So we have uh, another project called Gitaru Solar Power Generation. This project envisages um, both hydro and uh, solar power generation. The estimated cost of this project is a USD 57 million. Green energy is the way to go. We look forward to promote solar energy generation and we stand ready to make progress in this area through partnership with you and other stakeholders. Finally, I wish all the participants as well as um, you as we continue in-depth deliberations for this session, and I thank you to the organizers. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Orina, that you spoke to us about the project from the government itself in Kenya. Now the next, I will invite the representative for Philippines. Thank you very much to joining us, Mrs. Uh, 
Her Excellency, Mrs. Dina Joy Amaton. Thank you, thank you very much. And please, we are happy to listen to your words. Yes. It's the floor yes. is yours, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Dear friends from the Women's Federation for World Peace, Excellencies and colleagues, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good evening. If you are um, joining us, if you are in Asia uh, and, and elsewhere. The Philippines is glad to join the WFWP in today's side event of the CCPCJ entitled The New Village Development to Counter Involuntary Mig Migration and the Smuggling of Migrants. As a labor sending state, these issues are especially important for us. And we welcome the opportunity to engage with partners who are also working to address these matters. Now, according to the latest available full data from the Philippine Statistics Authority, there were approximately 2.2 million Filipinos working overseas in 2019, 56% of whom are women primarily in elementary occupations and in the sales and service industries. However, these figures do not take into account those who, who have gone out of the country through illegal means, such as human trafficking and um, smuggling of migrants. While the Philippine government continues to work on this problem from the legal perspective, it recognizes that migra migration driven by necessity which fuels trafficking in person, or persons also needs to take into account the domestic, economic, and development di dimensions so that migration becomes a choice rather than a need. This entails capacitating people through a concerted and cross-cutting effort aimed at giving them the ability to decide whether to stay in the country or to take a chance abroad through whatever channel is, is available. This is a significant undertaking for all stakeholders, from the government to the private sector. The dilemma is exacerbated by unforeseeable incidents such as the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which creates havoc in the system. Nonetheless, the government remains steadfast in its vision to create a stable, comfortable, and secure life for Filipinos through the medium-term de development plan of 2017 to 2022, and a long-term development plan called Ambicion Natin 2040. These plans are envisioned to deal with the issue of involuntary migration, among others. As the Philippines moves along this road, we welcome engagements that give positive impetus towards the goal of attaining freedom of choice when it comes to migration. We look forward to hear more from the WFWP it, on their new village development initiative in the Philippines and elsewhere, and wish all participants a productive hour ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Dina Joy Amatong, for your words and um, sharing on what the Philippines is doing and the emphasis on um, the, the freedom of migration and we're very happy that you're reaching out. And our first speaker um, of the Women's Federation today uh, is from the Philippines, uh, Mr. Mrs. Merle Christina Barlan. She's the, the Women's Federation for World Peace President of the Philippines, but also the International Vice President, the Chief Admin Administrative Officer and Deputy Director of the Offices for UN Relations in New York. So um, she, has a, she has played an active role in the United Nations NGO community for the past 24 years. And as a wife, mother to five children and a peace advocate, Mrs. Barlaam travels extensively between the USA and the Asia Pacific region, serving as a lecturer, a mentor and coach. She promotes peace leadership and education, strengthening families and working with civil society. So, Mrs. Barnan, we're very happy to have you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Kyungin. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, and um, extending my greetings to um, Her Excellency Ambassador of Kenya, Sela Mukaya Orena, and um, the beautiful, dynamic, charged affairs of Philippine Embassy to Austria. 
Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And to the panelists, my co-panelists here, to my colleagues, shout out to Philippines and all over the world. Um, thank you for joining us. I am greatly honored to be here and uh, to be participating in this very important discussion. Um, I am, th this, this event, this topic is very close to my heart because I was a farm girl born and raised in the hinterlands of the Philippines. I have seen the good and the bad of uh, living in the rural areas. Most of it are good, uh, you know, in the rural areas, uh, nature, you know, you can be in heaven, you can see heaven without closing your eyes. And, but the downside of it is, it's just the access to empowerment and information and education is, is um, hindering the heavenly part of it and um, the forced and involuntary migration. So, um, thus, the development of the project, uh, a peace village movement for our project hope for the Philippines. Please allow me to share my screen. I hope you can see it now. Okay, so um, we are using, we are um, doing this permaculture project because it is the way to counter um, forced migration. I have seen the social cost of uh, migration in any form, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, uh, because of food insecurity. And so um, we have started this initiative about seven years ago. And um, our goal is uh, we want to have a holistic and happy communities for a healthy planet by the year 2030. So why permaculture? Our vision is to establish income generating food forest managed collaboratively by young people and their families to cut down the social cost of migration. Um, our mission statement is to provide human resources, education, holistic experiential long-term investment and support, provide training, mentoring, financial, technical, social, spiritual, and this is the most important part in, in my personal opinion, is the parental leadership, mentoring and support that uh, any partner could give to the community in order to make the project successful. And we need to have a strategy and share it um, to the families. We need to have common goals and partnership towards interdependence and mutual prosperity. And um, then we can see sustainability. Then we need to practice the universal value stewardship, harmonious coexistence between people and the planet. Only when the community can really embody and take ownership and be the stewards of their own, own project and their own community can we see sustainability. And so what is permaculture? It's actually a permanent agriculture. It is the way God designed uh, the coexist, uh, the, the development of our environment, the land and the soil. So it is an approach to land management that adapts arrangement observed in flourishing natural ecosystem. It uses the principles in fields such as regenerative agriculture, healing of the soil so that it can be productive without the infusion uh, intervention of chemicals, synthetic chemicals and harmful chemicals, rewilding and community resilience. According to Bill Mollison, permaculture is a philosophy of working with rather than against nature, of protracted and thoughtful observation rather than protracted and um, thoughtless labor, and of looking at plants and animals in all, all their functions rather than treating any area as a single product system. So I'm um, here cutting the, co the social cost of voluntary and involuntary migration. I have seen, and we can even look around in Philippines, there are so many separation of families um, and it led to um, emptiness in the hearts of the parents and the children, mental health issues, suicides, teenage pregnancy, and drug addiction. 
And so we partner with local and international community leaders and stakeholders for local investment and expansion to generate local employment, food security, financial empowerment, social security, health and well-being for women, children, and their families, hence cutting the necessity of parent working far away from home. And so um, the action for uh, planet, hold on a second, SDG 13, Climate Action for Food Security. So our goal is to have 10,000 leaders of heart and character. We are going to train this future leaders, global leaders by 2030. So in 2016, Women's Federation Philippines invested in training 40 brilliant youth leaders to lead the way. After three years of training, the 10,000 Heroes League, a youth arm of Women's Federation Philippines was established in 2020 to lead the way in managing a communal food forest, a permaculture hub where young people all over the Bohol, Bohol and their Philippines, hopefully, and, and their families can be educated about regenerative way of farming. At the same time, learn skills to manage their own income generating home gardens and become stewards of the planet. Enriching and inspiring training ground for future global leaders to receive and give love to the earth people and the universe and promote permaculture as an education uh, as educational hobby and leisure activities for all ages integrating ecotourism projects international service projects in every village of the Philippines. So um, these are these pictures showed what we have done during the last seven years. We engage a lot with the community and uh, we had um, annual international service projects, uh, young people from all over the world right now as of um, this year, actually last year because, because of COVID we could not continue. We'd, we held our eighth international youth service leadership training program and service project. And these are from European youth leaders um, serving our community and enjoying and learning how to bond with nature at the same time, um, uh, learn how to uh, do the permaculture. So we call this our new UN. It's not United Nations, it's University of Nature. <laughs> so, and so we have the Airbnb, um, bed and breakfast, and um, it's really, and, and, and leisure and hobby. We want people to experience the permaculture is fun and beautiful. And when we do it right, when we, we know how to harmonize and love the creation, the creation, um, nature will love us back in a way that is so all encompassing. And um, it's a very holistic, wholesome experience. And this is our training center, it's under construction. Uh, we need $20,000 extra to complete. So this is our multi-purpose training center for martial arts student. It's gonna be a permaculture learning center and uh, cultural center. And um, yeah, that's it for now. And if you need to reach us out, if you are interested to be our partners, we are, and you're welcome to Bohol and you're welcome to Philippines. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Barlan, for elaborating on this beautiful project of hope, the Perma Peace Garden, Permaculture, encountering mental health issues, drug addiction, prevent teenage pregnancy. It's really beautiful and with assistance of this University of Nature. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, uh, I think we all would like to hear more about it, but time is short, but we will make sure uh, to get in touch and work together as well. So thank you so much. Next, we will, presenting, we will be presenting another Women's Federation project Light the Villages, and I would like to introduce Mrs. Susan Cohn. She's the Women's Federation President uh, of Kenya and also the International Vice President for the African Region. And she uh, has, uh, she's currently working on a green solar energy for the African Villages pilot project in rural Kenya and has a passion in women empowerment projects and is an advocate of women's rights and gender equality. Mrs. Cohn, my pleasure is to introduce you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very grateful to be here. 
And uh, I'd like to start with the greeting, Your Excellencies of the Kenyan Embassy and the Philippine Embassy. And also the honorable guests, distinguished panelists, beloved viewers, members, partners, and all supporters. It's indeed a very big pleasure for me to be here and to share the story of the green solar energy in the African villages. This was inspired by the need to lighten up uh, the villages and also to lighten up the homes. And not only that, to empower women in the rural areas. As uh, I was also born in the village setup, so I'm very familiar with uh, what's going on. And I really, I'm very passionate about this project. And I hope that by the end of the day of these presentations, you also join me in the, in the same passion to lighten up homes and also to bring, to bring light to the villages and to the homes. So I'd like to share my presentation. It's a very short one, given the time. And uh, it's uh, just a few slides. And uh, it's actually called the Green Solar Energy for the African Villages. This was inspired by the Women Federation Kenya, but also, but uh, it was sponsored by the Women Federation International. And uh, our pilot project is in a, in a, in a place called Makweni, uh, that is one county, in a place called Wate. Uh, there's many places where there's no electricity in Africa, and we really want to complement the government, what the governments are doing, what the NGOs are doing, so that together we can actually reach uh, the goals of, reach, of, of bringing electricity and light to all corners of this continent. So I'd like to move to the next uh, uh, slide. And uh, around 600 million people lack access to electricity in Africa. That is according to the World Bank in 2014. That is many years ago, like uh, almost like seven years ago. And uh, in rural electric electrification is still a challenge in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So that is why there is need uh, for us to do something and to make a difference before they actually get the electricity. As, uh, as many governments are trying their best, but sometimes there is also a, a vacuum and uh, a great need for, for light in the villages. So Women Federation sponsored the Green Solar Energy for African Villages in 2020. We started the project in 2020, and I, as I said, in Makweni County. But this project is also going to go, is going to many other counties and also in many countries in Africa. So this is the kind of lights, uh, solar lamps that we provide. There is a one for four bulbs, which we install in every home. And also the, the, the other one is just one, one light, one bulb, which make a big difference. So it doesn't matter which kind of home they have. We just in, installed in the villages, as you know, some of the villages, they, they have dashed uh, houses and others, they have uh, uh, iron sheet houses, but we, we do, they do install in each and every home. So the advantages of solar energy is a renewable energy source, an energy that is produced using resources that replenish quicker than the rate at which humankind consumes it. It is accessible anywhere to everyone as long as there is sun. As the... Uh, uh, Honorable Ambassador says that there is sun in Africa, so we do have lots of it, and you can use it for to lighten our villages and our homes. It also reduces electricity bills. It's typically labeled a green source of energy due to the lack of harmful environment side effects associated with its use. And uh, it has various applications. Solar energy can also be integrated into the material used for buildings. And solar energy systems do generally don't require a lot of maintainers. And uh, like the lamps we give is a one-off, so it's less expensive and uh, very easy to maintain. So the, the first project that we did, these are our first recipients. They could not actually believe it. In this uh, village, uh, most of the people are very, families are very poor. They cannot afford electricity. So we provided uh, the solar lamps and actually we installed for them. Most of the houses are like two rooms or four rooms. And sometimes they just have to share one kerosene lamp. Uh, so that means if someone wants, wants to go to the, to the bedroom, the other people are left in darkness or they have to go to the, to the washroom. Well, the other people have to be left in darkness. So we installed four barbed uh, lamps and it was a delight for the families. They couldn't actually believe, believe their eyes 
when they, they actually saw the light in their own homes. And uh, these are the beneficiaries of the solar lamps. It was a women group. We started with women groups because women are the ones who suffer most because they have to take care of the family chores, plus they make sure that the children do also their homeworks. So uh, the social impact is that all the recipients were so happy and thanked the Women Federation for the donations of solar lamps, as the area has many households who cannot afford electricity. Actually, it has improved the lives of families who no longer need to use kerosene, which affects the health of the families. And school children can now be, do their homework using the solar lamps. They don't have to wait for their mother to finish cooking so that they can use the lamp. They can use, actually do their homework while the mother is also cooking. And uh, mothers can cook their food and milk their cows in the evening using the light solar lamp. So it does make a difference. It makes a lot of difference, differences we never thought we'd make. And of course, green solar energy lamps is improving the lives of families and communities. And I thank the Kenyan government for their effort in actually not only bringing electricity to the, to the families in the communities and uh, different counties, but also uh, you know, the, the, the solar energy as well. So, so if, uh, if you want to partner with us, uh, we, have, uh, we have this initiative called Adopt a House a Household Initiative, Be the Light by Donating a Lamp. That means if you donate a lamp, you actually are light to that lamp. And in fact, what we are going to do is we are going to connect you with that family. So you will be their light. This is our, uh, our address and these are our numbers if you want to connect with us. And also, of course, if you want to partner with us. And we'll be very happy to make a difference with you to make this world a better place than we found it. I thank you all and God bless you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Cohn, for... Uh, for sharing about this uh, beautiful project, Light to Villages. You have proven that it's really improving the life and health of families in the rural areas, giving uh, 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 improving the chances they have for the future and supporting their education as well. I really enjoyed the practical um, uh, examples you gave. So it's very, we can see it's very powerful and uh, bless you for all of your work and um, thank you for your contact information as well. So please don't hesitate. Um, if you want to partner up, please uh, contact Ms. Cohn uh, to support this beautiful um, green solar energy project for the African villages, light the villages. Thank you. So having said that, we are gonna continue to our uh, last uh, panelist of uh, this event. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Franz Narada. He's a sociologist and writer and a member of the Earth Society Foundation, founded in 1970. And for 30 years, Mr. Narada has dealt with the issue of migration from rural areas to cities. And for several years, he served as a president of ECOVAS, the European Council of Villages and Small Towns in Austria, and also as the convener of the Equinox Earth Day at the UN in Vienna. And uh, the Earth Society Foundation is also a supporter of this event, so, Mr. Narada, very welcome, and the floor is yours. Unmute yourself one more time, please. You did? Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Technology is a little bit complicated. Uh, Greetings to your excellencies, the panelists uh, and everybody watching today. I will talk a little bit about a project uh, called the Village University, but most of the time that I have, these are only a few minutes, I would like to spend underlying the importance of uh, these things that we just heard. These are not just remainders of a past, uh, but surely rural areas are still treated as such. Um, and uh, we, we feel um, that uh, there is something wrong. I would like to link these two issues, urbanization and migration crisis, uh, as an introduction. And I think uh, that we have tremendous urbanization everywhere, but it's not solving uh, the migration crisis. Uh, in the opposite, uh, it's 
adding to people's uh, poverty and security and uh, the, 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 the misery in their lives. Uh, I don't want to, to go to details. I want to line out that instead of talking about migration to urban areas, we should be aware that there is something going on. The latest uh, is, was the COVID crisis, but there is something more going on. Already since 10 years, we are seeing a slow decline of global trade and globalization in favor of something like sending data around the world and produce locally. So we have potentially a future which looks very different from the future we envisioned up to now. So uh, I would like to stress this point that we might, we might face with all the technological changes that we see, uh, the decentralization of energy, but also decentralization of material production, a new rural renaissance. Sorry, that was again, not exactly what I wanted to, to do. Um, and uh, in this respect, I would like to also uh, stress that sustainability is probably not enough. Uh, we have harmed this planet so much that human presence within and together with nature is probably required to really clean up the mess humanity has mm -hmm. produced. I want to give you a very impressive example of this. This is the work in China there is, a, there is an area in the size of France that's called the Lust Plateau. And uh, China has proven that man can be the most beneficial force to restore nature. And uh, we need to take these examples globally. We cannot continue with the traditional way we produce food. Some scientists estimate that we have only 60 harvests left if we stick to industrial agriculture because our soil is dying. Permaculturalists know about that. But I want to say that it is not just agriculture as food production that is important, but agriculture as the center of production in general. Instead of using fossil materials, we can use phytogenic, plant-based materials, and we can Therefore, not only harvest the sun, we can also harvest industrial raw materials by re-expanding into rural areas. We see this revolution in production happening from one month to the other. This is a wonderful example of a brewery. So this brewery can not only produce drinking water and beer, it can also produce kombucha and it fits into a container and is symbolic. There are now car companies that want to produce locally decentralized electric car companies. So what does that all mean for education? That means that we need another form of education which is adopted to local circumstances. And this is what Village University tries to achieve. Instead of having a traditional curriculum, having modules supporting the needs of people locally delivered in educational centers. And I would like uh, uh, to, uh, to have one crown witness, one uh, person here who was always at the, at the forefront of promoting the, the urban future. And this is Ren Kolhas, who opened in 2019 uh, an exhibition with a talking title, Countryside, the Future. And he said, the more important things are now happening in the countryside. And we need to understand that our technology has shifted everything uh, from away from the urban uh, development to the global development. Finally, I would like to say concerning migration that this has the advantage that we can work on both ends. 
we can work on the end uh, of uh, countries where migrants are leaving because of land grabbing and the loss of uh, opportunities. There must be a total shift in availability of land for humans. And uh, there are fantastic cases, here is just one from India, uh, that uh, village development is in fact a way to assure the livelihood of billions. On the other side, we have examples here from Italy on the right side where uh, a mayor in Italy has proven that a dying Italian village, Riace, uh, has profited enormously from 300 migrants. So if we take that all together, I think we should consider that another world is possible. Thank you very much. Uh, and here are my data if you want to continue the discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Narada, for, uh, for showing this beautiful project and also for emphasizing uh, the need for a change, how to deal with nature and the possibilities there already are and the, the need for a shift, um, how we can um, enhance that uh, as human beings. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Earth Society Foundation to support this event. So we're coming almost to the close of this event and um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, doc, doc, Mrs. Henschen Moser uh, for the closing remarks. Uh, Mrs. Carolyn Henschen is uh, the Women's Federation for World Peace International um, United Nations Relations uh, Coordinator and also the International Vice President and recently elected uh, to be the President of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women. Um, Mrs. Henschen has been uh, leading the United Nations team in Geneva for 26 years and likes to guide uh, and train uh, young women uh, for advocacy. So Mrs. Henschen, please, the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to just say a few words. I'm sitting in Geneva we, with my assistant, who is also on the line, Ms. Shruti Lega. Uh, we attended the opening sessions of the uh, Committee on the Right to Development. And it's so clear how all these areas, uh, the, the most critical element is this kind of partnership, actually, creating opportunities where what's happening locally on the ground uh, can be understood by those who are in you know, decision-making positions at the higher end and really involving you know, civil society, understanding this sense of civic responsibility, which we had a, an event at the UN in Vienna a few years ago about, and at the same time as governments understanding that civil society has so much creativity and so much passion and is doing so many things, but we really have to sit together and listen to each other. Uh, here in Geneva also, we are working in this committee on the status of women. We're working, we're looking back at our uh, committee on the stat, uh, no, the commission on the status of women, 65. We're looking at the outcomes of this and we come to this same point of having this sense that uh, are we really, being taken seriously, civil society? And if not, what is the reason? Are we accountable enough? Are we, we're really analyzing this whole process. We're trying so hard to be in partnership, but things are not always working the way that we hope. And we can see clearly that things could, problems could be solved so much quicker. Things could develop so much more quickly if really this kind of partnership was more really like a skin touch and of course, there's a danger in so many virtual kind of um, meetings that maybe we become even less in contact with each other. So I just want to applaud this meeting today as really being a great balance of government support, the government listening, and also civil society really showing some really brilliant, simple, basic kind of programs that are actually in fact uh, affecting a large number of people and which can be replicated, you know, if governments want to listen in and have time and make time to listen in. So anyway, just thank you very much to the organizers and the partners and of course the, the, the two embassies. 
and speakers. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Henschen Moser, for being here to, uh, with us and for um, offering the closing remarks. Very happy that you could join us. And uh, so we're almost at the end of our virtual side event on the, on the, from, of this 30th Commission uh, on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. And we're very happy and grateful that you all could be here. And we want to extend our appreciation and thanks to all of our panelists and speakers of today um, for showcasing these beautiful projects uh, with inspiring people, bringing people together, enhancing the livelihood and uh, the development of different ways how to treat each other and the universe and um, um, producing equal rights for everyone and the freedom of possibilities. So um, we hope you all are inspired to consider these as role models to prevent involuntary migration, crime, such as human trafficking, exploitation and abuse. And as these best practices are contributing to create a safe, sustainable and enriching environment uh, for our communities and all over the world, we hope you will join in and work together. And uh, as for myself, as an unaccompanied, as a legal guardian and child advocate of unaccompanied minor asylum seekers here in the Netherlands, um, I encounter the lack of two very important things uh, every day with my minors, and that is that there is most definitely no place like home when there is peace and development and fair chances for the future. And also point two, that as my minors are separated, involuntarily separated by their of their parents because of war and violence, um, I see every day that there is no greater force then uh, the power of love and um, the security of life shared within families. Mm -hmm. So having said that, thank you so much. We want to thank the embassies again, your excellencies. Thank you so much for taking the time and all the participants and attendees to be here with us. So um, as we are closing, I would like to make a photo of the panelists. So if all panelists could uh, smile, then we will make a photo. So I just say like one, two, three, smile. Thank you. Maybe one more time, smile. Thank you so much. So it is, um, thank you excellencies and all panelists. We will, um, close this session officially and then we will have a Q&A answering session um, after the official closing for 15 minutes or so, not very long, but we hope to answer a few questions. And also if you have any questions, please note them in the chat or the Q&A, which is actually working. So we're very happy about that. And we will make sure to forward your questions to our speakers as well. On behalf of the Women's Federation uh, for World Peace International, we are very happy and hope to see you again uh, on other uh, events and endeavors. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. So shall we start our Q&A session? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because actually, I really uh, would very much like to uh, to put one question first to our really, really uh, precious ladies from the embassy. And the question was, uh, we would be very interested after hearing all this, maybe you can give us uh, one more idea how you see the future of cooperation with countries and, uh, and the uh, social... Uh, the NGO side, the, uh, uh, the side from NGOs. So maybe uh, Mrs. Orina from the Kenyan Embassy, would you like to come first with a uh, final idea or encouragement yes. or inspiration? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, it is true that uh, governments don't work alone. Uh, they work with other partners and actors and um, 
um, governments encourage a lot of uh, private partnerships, you know, private public private partnerships. And uh, sometimes civil society has been very influential and, and very critical in initiating policies, you know, and uh, agitating for policy change and all that. And this should continue. Governments and civil society can organize joint events. We can have joint events to create public awareness and uh, public participation in some of these initiatives and even to come up with fresh ideas that can rejuvenate and revive areas where we need uh, a change. So exchanging information and sharing information is another way that we can do it. And I know that it is doable. We are working for the same global good, the same regional good. So it's not a competition. It's just a checks and balances to achieve the same good for humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Ambassador. So we are very grateful we can make, we could make the first step between our lady, our sister in Kenya, Susan Kona and you. Maybe it's the first step, maybe not, but maybe we can also increase the partnership and the getting to know each other. That's it's, excellent. I welcome that. Some ideas how to do it, because now we sit like all together, but in the reality, we are a few hundred kilometers apart from each other with Susan. So, but maybe we can arrange some kind of meeting. Yeah, now we can do it. There is cable, communication is easy with the information technology. We are now doing this under the COVID-19 restrictions, but here we are, we are able to communicate and I'm glad for that. So I welcome that meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we also, I also would really very much like to ask uh, your excellency, Mrs. Amaton, if you want to uh, add to what you said in the beginning after hearing the presentations. Yes, oh, thank you very much. But before I answer the question uh, put forth in, um, in, the, in the chat group, I also want to um, say that I watched with great interest the presentation of my kababayan, um, Ms. Marlaan uh, from Bohol, the Philippines, and um, watched with uh, interest the permaculture initiative that she has been doing, um, she has been um, promoting the past several years, especially with the specific um, focus on building youth leadership. And I think, I mean, um, it, it's good that she and her um, collaborators um, are trying to um, develop a more responsible, climate sensitive, sustainable, caring um, youth leaders. So I also watched with great interest the presentation of Ms. Kony on the, the role of women, especially on, on electrification. And um, I think a lot of lessons can also be learned um, from the presentation um, that was given um, this afternoon. Now, going back to the question on um, civil society, I agree definitely with my colleague from the Kenyan Embassy about how important um, uh, partnership is with, with civil society and with NGOs. Now, in the, in the Philippines, we have always been open to engagement with um, civil society and NGOs. And um, our civil society sphere um, has always been active and dynamic. And in fact, even for um, before legislation, key legislation is passed, there is always a stakeholder um, consultation um, process where NGOs and, you know, and ordinary individuals can, can participate. So I think um, it is important that we keep on um, having these channels of communications, uh, of communications open and that we hear and learn from each other. I mean, um, definitely NGOs and civil society um, have their own expertise and we in government are also, would also want to tap into that um, expertise. So again, I hope that the communication lines remain open and that in the end, um, although we may have different mandates, we're getting different mandates, um, we do have in so many cases the same goals, and that is to protect our planet, to empower our, our people, to have, you know, to um, work for better lives for our um, populations. I think um, this event this afternoon is a good example 
of um, partnership and cooperation between government and, um, and, and civil society. And I hope that it's multiplied in other um, fora as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you very much for your participation. Also from our side, from my side, I'm, I'm Women Federation Austria. I'm not, I'm only the president of the chapter in Austria. So the more international level is Mrs. Caroline Anjin. Um, maybe there is some questions among the panelists. Is there one more? Is there questions among the panelists towards each other or towards um, Her Excellency Mrs. Amatong or Mrs. Orinia? Orina? Nelly, you want to ask a question? You look like. Carolyn is raising her hand. Well, I am not really a panelist, so I think you have preference. So, uh, you know, if you don't have something, I would, but please go ahead, Merle. Huh? Well, I'm just overwhelmed with joy. Um, I, my, I spent 25 years in, in, um, in America learning how to uh, contribute uh, economic development and uh, social upliftment in, in Philippines. And my 16 years experience at the UN back in, in 2012 really um, gave me, it was like a, a turning point for me because I would attend hundreds and hundreds of conferences at the UN speaking about um, peace and development. But when I go back to my village, that development is not felt in my village. There was literally no road and um, fetching water was very hard. And so it led, it gave me the passion and the enlightenment to go back and establish like a 10 year development framework, a community development framework from the bottom up. And um, actually we found out that where the government partnership and the local community stakeholders and um, training, education, 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 is very important and over time it will grow and um, there is so much hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mirali. So maybe Caroline, you want to add? Uh, yes, I, I hope I didn't miss someone having the same question because I was out, out for a couple minutes, but I think I just have the basic question to our government representatives, Ambassador, Ambassador Arena, and also um, Chargé d'Affaires Amatong. You know, as civil society, I think we are really soul searching. I feel, especially also in Geneva, we're trying to think, how can we really create stronger partnership with governments, not just token, you know, but really, really work together more closely because clearly those that have the, the, the foot in the ground, you know, locally, we have something uh, so important for governments and governments have something very important that we need too, with, you know, forming the laws and, you know, the larger, maybe the broader perspective. And uh, so maybe my simple question would be, um, what kind of advice would you give to NGOs as a government representative, so we could you know, become closer and work more closely together. And I, I saw this in Vienna when we worked on FGM actually at the, at the conference there, that actually many governments attended and really with this sense of this was their issue too and our issue. And we were, we were really like equal, sort of like almost like peers looking at this problem together from different angles and learning from each other and uh, trying to solve this problem together. So what well, maybe any advice you might have to us Please. Okay, let me go uh, fast uh, in uh, trying to answer that question. And um, just like as it is in any relationship, the more you continue to collaborate, mm -hmm. continue to talk to each other, continue to do things together, you will understand the other side, mm -hmm. the issues, the interests, the challenges, and the other side will understand the same of the other side. So I would urge that the civil society keep on knocking the doors of government. Keep on knocking, even if it means wanting to break that door, 
keep on knocking. Take a keen interest in what is happening. And uh, that way, you will get to be part of what government is doing. They will invite your views. And when you have something, communicate to government in one way or another. Uh, we say, um, uh, for instance, us as diplomats, we are men and women of letters. If um, the WF, WP writes to the mission, we are going to definitely respond. Whatever you have, write to the mission, write to the relevant ministries, and you will be able to get a response. We are endeavoring, we have, um, for instance, in Kenya, a service charter that indicates that uh, when we get uh, correspondence within seven days, we should be able to give a response. Mm. If we cannot be able to give you a substantive response, if the question requires that we need to do in-depth um, research, for instance, before we get back to you, we acknowledge, say we have received this and give us more time, we shall revert with more substantive response later. So, but the point I'm trying to make is keep knocking, continue to engage, continue to talk to the government. And in that way, you'll be able to um, enhance the partnership and the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much for this answer. So I think there'll be many knocks at your door. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very encouraging for me to, to hear and we will, we will build on this, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you so much, Mrs. Amatong, uh, Mrs. Uh, Irina. And now we also want to ask Mrs. Amatong if she wants to respond to this question. Or did she leave already? So yeah. 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 Yes. Thank you yes. very much. Yes, thank you so much for the question. And very quickly, what we in government um, would like to have, of course, is like a genuine partnership, which is based on respect and um, understanding of each other's um, positions. We, of course, in government have a, um, a bigger responsibility because we have to balance many, many issues um, at the same time. And so I hope also that NGOs and civil society would understand we, what, where we are coming from um, in that respect. But sometimes there's also the danger of um, government and civil society relations as being uh, or positions as being in a state of conflict, which is not necessarily um, and the case. I think we should also um, look at very good um, partnerships and, and relationships that have been established and see that as role models for um, cooperation between um, NGOs and, and government. But again, um, would like to also emphasize that we in government, sometimes we get the brunt of a lot of um, um, complaints. So I also want to um, emphasize the need for mutual respect in any, in any um, engagement um, that we have, that we may have between you know, civil society and, and, and government. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Amato. Um, thank you very much for this open response. And I think we, we will take it up. We will do our best from our side to enhance the in cooperation and uh, also being open on uh, documentation about what is happening. We've been trying to do this. I brought, I think, the documentation of Mrs. Balan, a whole year's book. It was a big book to the embassy. I don't know if it came into your hands because of COVID, we could not make personal uh, meetings. I just left it at the door, at the port here. But we can, uh, in, we can develop the cooperation because of techniques. We can make other meetings if there is interest from your side and Mrs. Palan, so that we can increase the, yeah, the, in, the in, inspiration of each other. And uh, yeah, maybe Caroline, is this what, what you wanted? Is this answer to your question? Uh, yes, actually music <laughs> to my ears, actually. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. So I think uh, I, for my side, I would really say a last very big thank you to uh, both representatives of embassies, because we know your time is very precious and you have whole countries to, are uh, you responsible for, you have tight schedules. We appreciate so much that you spend so much time with us. And with a last greeting and farewell, we want to 
we leave you from your responsibility of being with us. And uh, I think I give back to Kyung In, but uh, basically we said after 15 minutes, we will close the session. We are 15 minutes over the time, but because we are free, there's no room needed by someone else. We took this time. So thank you very much, Your Excellency, Mrs. Amatong, Your Excellency, Mrs. Orina. And also from my side, I really want to say thank you very much for all the participants. Uh, some have left already, but we had many registrations and there was much uh, feedback. It was so interesting, so inspiring. I think 10 times, 20 times in the chat. So thank you very much for all of that from my side. And Kyung In, do you want to say a last word? Yes, thank you, Renata. Mrs. Ames Bauer, thank you very much. And uh, we would also like to thank you as you were the secretary and a huge part of our outreach team for this side event. So thank you so much for all of your hard work. We would also like to uh, thank the technical team that uh, had a lot of work and uh, we have received a lot of questions. Uh, which we'll, we will um, forward to the speakers um, as, as, as good as we can. So thank you also all attendees for participating. And um, let's, like the, the excellencies mentioned both, let us work together and keep giving each other the benefit of the doubt and with mutual respect um, to uh, keep knocking on that door like... Um, the Excellency said, and um, to remind ourselves that we all are needed to make this world a, a better place. And uh, our participation is requested from whatever function or role we're playing it at the moment. So again, uh, all panelists from, from all the uh, corners of the, the earth, uh, from New York, from Kenya, and from Austria, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we wish you um, a beautiful rest of the day and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Photo. Bye. Tongue in photo. Nice photo with everyone smiling. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's make another photo. Yes, that's but very good. Smiling. So at the end, the spirit is always the best. So um, if we could make, wave, make one more photo. So maybe we can wave, but like with hands still. <laughs> Whatever. Miss Universe, the Miss Universe wave. <laughs> and uh, I hope our technical team are making a few pictures right now. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ladies, thank you're doing you. the great work. We appreciate you all and have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Congratulations. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Marie Royal. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Merle. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank thank you, thank you everyone. God bless thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. God bless you. Bye. Thank you, Kyungin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lily.